This might be one of my most asked for training modules. It details all of the technical indicators that I look at when I trade the zero date expiration strategy and why I've got so many monitors. Let's take a look at it. So there's 13 primary indicators that I try to keep on top of throughout the trading day as I'm trading the zero data expiration strategy. Uh, there are obviously hundreds and hundreds of indicators, but these are the ones that I find give me the best bang for your buck. And you'll find that as you start looking at indicators, they're either um, contrarian indicators or they're based on price and volume. And they may interpret that data a little bit differently but that's what they're all using as a database. And so you don't really need uh, 100 indicators. In fact, you may not need all 13 of these, but these are the ones that I do look at. And this is one of the questions that comes up quite often is, why do I have 97 monitors and 12 different computers? It, it, it's not really that much, but it seems like it at times. Uh, and that's because not all of these indicators are able to be overlaid on top of one another and be readable. And so uh, certain ones that we'll get into here, like maybe Bollinger Bands and Stochastics and Pivot Points, you could certainly overlay those on top of each other and only use one screen, uh, but you can't do that with all of them. And so I do like to have them separated out on about a half a dozen different screens, and it's just easier for me to look at them like that. So let's go ahead and get into them and, and kind of how I use them and how I set them up. Uh, you know, if we go back to the old school method, um, when I started as a stockbroker in 1987, uh, all we really had was time and sales. And um, that was it. It was just what we called the order book. And it was our ability to be able to see uh, orders coming in and the time stamps on those orders and uh, how big the order was. What was the volume? And was it on the bid side or was it on the ask side? Time and sales moved really, really fast, and you frankly had to be pretty darn good at what we called reading the tape to be able to get any really good discernible information out of it, just a, a above and beyond what you could just simply see by watching the charts. But times have changed, and technology has really caught up with the average day trader, and they can have access to the same technical indicators that all of the pros on Wall Street are using. So. Let's walk through these. There's about 13 of them that I do use. There's the trend, the tick, the accumulation distribution difference, the put call ratio, uh, the S&P 500 up and down volume difference, the VIX, level two quotes, implied volatility ranking, fast stochastics, Bollinger Bands, pivot points, the VWAP, volume weighted average price, and then a four chart time overlay. So let's take a look at each one of these individually and just kind of walk through them. Now I will say that this is not a definitive training here on each one of these. Otherwise we'd be spending about 30 to 40 minutes on each one, uh, but it will give you an idea. And you can at your leisure put a little bit more effort into the, ex uh, the education part of this. But the trend, or what was back in the day called the ARMS Index, and it was called the ARMS Index because it was developed by a guy named Richard ARMS in the 70s, but it's now generally referred to as the trend. Uh, it's a short-term technical analysis stock market trading indicator based on the advanced decline data. So the name is short for trading index. And uh, you can see the mathematical formula there for the trend. We take advancing issues divided by declining issues. And then we divide that by the advancing volume divided by the declining volume. Okay, so this is basically a price volume indicator and generally a value below one, a little bit uh, counterintuitive, a, a value below one indicates bullish sentiment and a value above one would indicate bearish sentiment. Uh, so anything above uh, 1.5, for example, uh, would be very, very bearish. The index was introduced again by Richard Arms 
and it's generally used for uh, day trading. Not always, but that's generally the way that I prefer to use it. And if you look at the trend, you can see right there, that's a chart of the trend uh, and how that's functioning for the S&P 500. And you can see again where the trend is going and that gives us a little bit of an idea of where the market is heading. So the trend is something that I look at every day. The tick obviously is a little bit more self-explanatory. A tick is just an up or a down movement in price. Now there are some securities as it mentions here like futures contracts where they actually trade in ticks. So they will refer to a five tick move. But you can also calculate ticks on the market as a whole. So the, we simply take the market which in our case generally speaking is the S&P 500. We take all 500 of those. Uh, look at the total numbers of securities in there and then look at the last trade and that would give us an idea. So a positive tick, meaning something you know was getting bid up, a positive tick is good for bullish sentiment. Uh, it means that the market as a whole has a lot of buying interest and uh, by contrast a negative tick would mean that uh, the pressure is now more to the downside. So the tick looks something like this and that's something that I'm looking at consistently as well to see whether it's balanced or not. Now on this particular day that I took this snapshot you can see overall except for right in here pretty darn balanced day between the buyers and the sellers. So that gives us for our trading purposes with zero date expiration when we're looking at a tick like this gives us a little bit more confidence on being able to put those wings in just a little bit closer than maybe we would normally do when we have a day that's just filled with ticks like this. Okay, The accumulation distribution line or the AD line, uh, it's a cumulative indicator and again it's based on volume and price and it basically just helps us understand if a stock is under accumulation or distribution. So what we're looking for with the AD indicator are divergences. Okay? We're looking at divergences specifically between the price of the stock and the volume flow. So it is, and this sounds a little counterintuitive, it is possible to have a stock that is appreciating. It is going up in price but we're getting a volume divergence. That volume is falling away and that gives us an indication that maybe that accumulation is starting to dry up and we could see a, a price decline coming. So this is uh, what we see here in terms of our accumulation distribution chart. You can see as you juxtapose that up against the market as a whole, you can get an idea of you know where is the market going. And this is interesting, the last little part of this day right here. Uh, you could see that basically we were in mostly a distribution mode. The market wasn't necessarily selling off, but the volume on the buy side was drying up. So I use this indicator uh, every single day. The put call ratio. Now this is one that is not necessarily applicable for day trading or zero day to expiration strategies, but it is something that I always keep my eye on just in terms of trying to keep my finger on the pulse of the market and whether or not we're in one of those phases where we're getting ready to change direction. We've been in a bullish market, it seems like forever, but we know that at some point we are going to have a correction and the market will come back down. Contrarian indicators, and there's several of them out there, but contrarian indicators are one of my favorite groups of indicators to look at. They also seem to be over time some of the most accurate and the put call ratio is definitely a contrarian indicator. Uh, it is a sentiment indicator. It's a contrarian indicator and it, it gauges how bullish people are in the marketplace or how bearish they are. Okay, So as a contrarian investor, I, I consider myself a contrarian investor, uh, we want to turn bearish when too many people are bullish and we want to turn bullish when too many traders are bearish. Right. So traders buy puts as insurance against a market decline or as a directional bet. 
Calls are used for insurance purposes as well. Sometimes they're bought as a directional bet on rising prices. Put volume generally increases when expectations are there for a decline. Uh, conversely, call volume would increase when there's expectations for a increase. So this is a sentiment indicator. And it is showing us where these extremes in the marketplaces are. So a put call ratio at the lower extremities, down at the bottom, would show very high bullishness. Okay, Because a lot of call volume would be uh, taking place in the marketplace. It means everybody's bullish, everybody's buying calls. As a contrarian indicator, that means we should get bearish. So in, in contrarian terms, excessive bullishness, again, it's going to uh, set us up for more bearish type trades. So again, a put call ratio in the upper extremities, well, that would imply bearishness. Okay, uh, That means everybody's buying call options, and so we should look to the downside. So you can see kind of how this has worked over time. This is a chart from 1998 to 2002, a very volatile period in the marketplace, and a period where we saw extreme highs and extreme lows not only in volatility, but in directional bias in the marketplace. And you can see over time here, as we hit these incredibly bullish levels, as people are just piling into calls, that would have been a good time to get short in the marketplace, right? As people are piling into calls right here, would have been a good time to get short the marketplace. As people pile into calls right here, again, good time to get short the marketplace. So you can see that contrarian approach uh, it might not uh, uh, shock you too much to know that the put call ratio is in an extreme right now. As the market is at all-time highs, we've got a lot of bullishness. We've got a lot of call buying going on. That means a couple of things for us. Uh, number one, it's cheaper now to hedge than it's almost ever been. So I'm going to throw up another video tonight on uh, the hedge strategy that I prefer uh, to hedge to the downside in the marketplace. But that information... Do you hedge? Is it expensive or is it cheap to do so? All of that comes from the put call ratio. Okay. One of my favorite indicators uh, is the ball SPD or the volume spread difference. Okay, the volume spread index just simply shows the difference between the volume on stocks that are going up or advancing on the day and the volume of stocks that are declining or going down that day. Okay, So it's, it's looking at whether stocks are going up or down, but it's primarily focused on the volume that is taking place there. Now, this is a tool that I use primarily for day trading, short-term intraday charting periods. Okay, uh, But it is helpful for us to see divergences again. We're not necessarily looking whether the stock is going up or down. We're looking at the volume behind that movement. And again, on the particular day that I took this uh, snapshot here, you can see that the up volume, which is in green, and the down volume, which is in red, pretty darn balanced, pretty darn fair. You know, that's a fairly balanced chart right there on the day. And again, that gives us some data to work with in terms of when we are selecting strike prices for our zero day to expiration. On a day like this, I would feel a lot more comfortable coming in closer on our strikes because of that balance that we're seeing there. Now, how do you use these things and how can they be a tool to sort of give you a, a tell of maybe where the market is going. Okay, so a couple things here. Number one, one of the rules that we try to follow uh, that's a hard and fast rule in our trading room is we want to be out. We want to have exited our zero date expiration trades uh, before the market closes because we know that there is a lot of volatility that happens in the last hour, last half hour of trading. We don't want to be involved in that. This is a chart that I took a snapshot of um, this month, uh, February 2021, and I believe this was the 8th. If I remember right, this day was the 8th, and we were trading in our trading room. You can see right here, this is this whole day from right there, that bar, to this bar. That was the 8th. Okay, and uh, we opened up and then we sort of sold off 
and we were able to get a put option in down around in this area here and our put option was doing great and uh, we just never got a call in. We never got a call leg in. And a lot of our members in our live trading room were like, come on, man, let's get a call leg in here. And uh, I never issued the call to put a call leg in. And the reason for that was, even though the market was not really going anywhere, in fact, you can kind of make the case that if the market was directional at all, it was down, right? We opened up with this big pop from the futures here, and then we almost immediately started to sell off. And while we had some rebounds in here, you can see that the trend pretty much all day long was down. In fact, right up to the close, uh, an hour before the close, we were still down on the day. It had been a bearish day all day long. However, uh, if you look over here, you can see what was the volume difference indicator telling us. Guys, the market had been selling off all day long, but the up volume was much greater than the down volume. And that had been building, 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 building all day long, building, building, building into the close. And right there, that was about maybe an hour left in the day, it really started to ramp. That's not reflected over here yet in the marketplace, uh, but it certainly would be eventually. And that's why I never issued the call. Had a couple members come after uh, the day was over and say, man, I put a call again in spite of you not doing it. And it blew right through my legs there. What did you see? What were you looking at? How did you know? Well, I didn't know. You never know. But I was watching this all day long, just ramp, 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 okay? So uh, again, the uh, uh, the volume spread difference, vol SPD is the ticker that you use inside of Tastyworks. I track this uh, very, very religiously uh, as we are trading our zero date expiration strategy. The VIX, or what is sometimes referred to as the volatility index or the fear index. Uh, the VIX simply tracks the expected volatility for the next 30 days as a percentage on an annualized basis. Okay, So, for example, if the VIX is at 20 right now, uh, that is projecting out that over the next 30 days, the market will have volatility of 20% of its annualized basis on the annualized basis okay so basically when we look at the VIX the VIX has a negative correlation to the S&P 500 when the uh, when the volatility is high the market's usually crashing low when everything is hunky-dory and complacent in the market and the volatility is low the market is high right so there is a negative correlation there with the S&P 500 but the other thing that the VIX really helps us with in this negative correlation here, and you can see these two different colors. One is a little bit more teal. That's the VIX right there. This is a little bit more blue. That's the S&P 500. You can see that if you do an overlay of the VIX and the S&P, they almost look like a mirror image, right? Just a, an inverse image of each other. And so the idea behind the VIX is when the VIX is low, it's time to go. When the VIX is high, it's time to buy, right? So when the VIX was high, when the market was crashing right here, uh, and the VIX was way up here, the VIX was signaling that fear was at its all-time high, and that is the time to jump in. As uh, Baron von Rothschild said, you want to buy when blood runs in the streets, right? So at the point of maximum pessimism, maximum fear, that's when we jump in. Uh, when the VIX is low, and uh, guys, the VIX is low. <laughs> the VIX is very, very low right now uh, because, of course, the market is at all-time highs. When the VIX is low, it's time to go. Okay, And this also affects us from a premium standpoint. IV, which we're going to get into here, implied volatility, uh, is based off of fear in the marketplace. The more volatility we have, the more fear we have, the higher, more expensive option premiums are. And as primarily 
option sellers, we like really, really expensive options. And so it's a little bit inverse in terms of what a lot of people think. They say, oh, you know, if the market was always calm and never moved, I can see this zero date expiration strategy would be successful for me over time. But the market's scary now, and it's all over the place, and there's a lot of volatility, and it's shooting up one day and crashing the next day. Guys, that's the very best day. That is the best situation we can hope for as zero-date expiration traders uh, because that gives us a spike in implied volatility, gives us a little bit of an edge, a little bit of an advantage. Okay, So to understand that and how that applies, we need to look at one of the most important indicators that we can use when we are looking for trading ideas. So we've said that there's a lot of things that come into play that determine the price of an option. But options are just like any other commodity in the world today. They're like bananas or cars. Sometimes they're fairly priced, but generally they're either overpriced or underpriced, right? The market is rarely efficient. And so as option sellers, we want to sell expensive options, right? We want to sell high priced options. So to do that, uh, we use IVR, the implied volatility ranking. Now, to understand IVR, we need to understand IV. And to understand IV, we need to understand standard deviations, okay? So IV, implied volatility. It's one of the key metrics for trading options. And IV is just determined by taking the current price of an options contract on whatever we happen to be trading. And then it is based as or represented as a percentage. Okay, so it would be 15%, 30%, 50%. Now that percentage indicates the annualized expected one standard deviation range for a stock. So when you look at options pricing and it says that the IV rank of this is 42%, that's what it's telling us. So for example, right here, this example right here, uh, an IV of 25% on a $200 stock, that means that over the next year, a one standard deviation move or a one standard deviation range on that stock would be 25% or $50. So that's what that's implying that the, uh, the one standard deviation move potential over the next year, about $50. Okay, now standard deviation, what is a standard deviation? Well, it's just statistics and it's just a measurement that encompasses a pro approximately 68.2% of all outcomes. So you guys have all seen the bell curve, right? standard deviation moves and uh, a one standard deviation move says that there is approximately a 68% probability of the stock settling inside of that range. So back to our example here, if we have a $200 stock, it's got an IV of 25%, it means that there is an implied 68% chance or a 68% probability that the stock is going to be in that $50 range move, okay? Uh, between uh, 150 on the downside, 250 on the up. So why is this all important? Well, this information all now allows us to calculate IVR, implied volatility ranking. Now, what's the difference between IV and IVR? Well, implied volatility is, as you see here, it is the percentage uh, of the annualized expected one standard deviation move, right? But implied volatility ranking now takes that number and looks at it on that specific underlying over time, historically. Now, why is that important? Well, as option sellers, one of the primary things that we look for in our underlines is an implied volatility, an IV of 50% or greater. If you can find a stock that is trading with a 50% IV or greater, those are some expensive options. And we should, if, if, if we're worth our druthers, we should be able to figure out some strategy to throw at those expensive options that could give us an edge, that could give us a potential uh, a decent reward, okay? That's a lot of volatility. Some of the crazy stocks right now, uh, uh, these meme stocks, uh, trading GME right now, uh, it, it's over 100%. 
implied volatility, right? It's pretty hard to not find an opportunity to make money in those kinds of stocks. Well, in the zero date expiration strategy, we trade the indices. Now, you could trade any index you want, but we generally trade the S&P 500. Well, what's the IV? What's the implied volatility of the overall market? Because it's like 13. It's like 13%. And so it's very easy to say right up front, wait a minute. So, you know, if there's stocks that are out there with 50% IVs and the market is 13%, man, I'm really, I'm really cutting myself short in terms of the potential return that I can make. And I'm probably taking too much risk on by trading the index rather than these high IV stocks. Well, that's not really the point. The point is, whatever we trade, just like any other commodity in the world, at times it's going to be fairly valued, at times it's going to be overvalued, at times it's going to be undervalued. So, for example, I'm trading GME stock, GameStop, right now. Well, the IV, you might make a case right now that the implied volatility on that main means that that stock is undervalued because it was two, three, four hundred percent IV on that stock. And now it's down to just like a, a paltry hundred percent, right? So it might actually be undervalued based on what it has historically been, what its ranking has been over the last few weeks versus the marketplace. Yeah, the market only has a 13% IV right now, but what if it suddenly spikes up to 15%? What that means is that relative to its historical number of 13, it is now overvalued. And that's an opportunity for us. So it's not always about IV. It's not always about how much IV is involved in the underlying that we are trading. It's about where it ranks historically relative to where it has been, right? And so that's what we look for in the marketplace. We don't really care that it hasn't, I mean, it's had IV as low as nine. It's had IV as high as 20. What we're looking for is that historical number where it currently ranks today, and is it overvalued or undervalued? And that helps us in building our trades. So IVR, very important, okay? And that's what we're talking about here. It just helps us understand where that IV rank sort of ranks in terms of volatility over a historical period of time, okay? So you can look at uh, the IV here. We look at this as uh, just a, on a daily chart. You can see the IV here in the marketplace. This is the market open right here. This is the market close right here. And you can see that IV has slowly, slowly diminished as the day went on. Now, this is what we want as zero date expiration traders, this is what we want. We want high IV in the morning so that we can sell very expensive options. And as the day goes by, we not only have theta kicking in and eroding the value of our positions, but we also have vega helping us out as well. Volatility is starting to drop. Unfortunately, we've had not several days, but several weeks where the inverse takes place and IV is actually ramping throughout the day. And you look at the chart and you look at the pricing and you're like, my options are well positioned on my strike prices. I'm still not making any money yet. And sometimes you don't make any money on those positions until 20, 30 minutes before the close on the day. And you're like, what's happening? I'm well positioned. It's a high probability trade. Nothing's getting, none of my legs are getting threatened. Yeah, IV was ramping throughout the day. So watching that IV throughout the day gives you some insight into what's happening with your positions, okay? And again, the whole idea, guys, the whole premise behind being a credit trader rather than a debit trader, the whole idea behind selling options versus buying options is that we are selling something that is overpriced and we're gonna arbitrage the difference, okay? And historically, that has worked. Historically, what we see is that the uh, implied volatility of an underlying is almost always higher than the historical volatility. And that kind of makes sense because the future is unknown where the past, of course, is known. Certainty 
takes away volatility, uncertainty adds volatility, right? So we want to sell these high priced options, take advantage of this disparate number right here. The next one that I use, and again, I don't use this as much uh, as I used to because of new uh, innovations with software that we have, but level two quotes are still valuable. It's sometimes what we used to refer to as the order book. And the order book just simply tells us uh, a couple of things. You can see here, you know, who, the, who is the market maker? Who is it that's trading this position? Uh, what's the price that the trade is being done at? And then how many shares? You take how many shares it says that they're trading, the size right there, and you times it by 100. And that will give you the order size. So you know who's trading. You know if it's on the bid. You know if it's on the ask. You know what the size is. you got your time and sales number flowing in here, and you can see all the trades coming in. It's a good way to get a feel for what the big institutional buyers are doing in the marketplace. Are they loading up on sells? Are they loading up on buys, right? Are they hitting the bid? Are they hitting the ask on all of these orders? Now, one of the reasons that I have said that I've gotten away a little bit from using level two quotes is because of ECNs or electronic communication networks. So ECNs uh, are computerized placement systems. And anybody can trade on an ECN, guys. So institutions today, uh, if they want to establish some trading positions, they can do it without letting people know. They can hide those trades through the use of an ECN. So while level two quotes is still valuable, it still helps us understand kind of you know what the flavor of the market is and what people are doing, it's not quite as valuable as it once was. But I still use them. Okay. Stochastics. I love stochastics. Um, it, it's an oscillator. That, that's another type of in indicators that you're going to look at is an oscillator. And uh, it generally consists of two lines and it's based on momentum. So stochastics uh, can be a little bit of a leading indicator. And that's nice because a lot of the indicators that we use, things like the MACD, the moving average convergence divergence, a lot of indicators like that are historical in nature. They're compiling historic data, right? And so they're not going to give us an indication to buy or sell right when the price starts to move. It's going to lag a little bit, but stochastics can give us a little bit of a better reading on that. And it basically just shows us whether a stock or underlying has moved into overbought territory or oversold territory. Okay. Now, just because something has moved into overbought territory, eh, it doesn't mean that it can't become more overbought, right? And just because something's moved into oversold territory doesn't mean it can't continue to be oversold even more. But it does give us a probability or an indication of an impending reversal starting to come our way, okay? So I just laid this down right here. This is on GME. This is what I've been trading here lately is a lot of GME. And you can see right here throughout the day, if you had wanted to day trade GME here, that just following the fast stochastics could have been a good indicator. So you'll see two teal lines here, the 80 line and the 20 line. The 80 line, when it's above that, implies that it's overbought, means it's a little too pricey. Below the 20 line implies that it's oversold, means that it's been pushed down too much. Okay, So the idea is you would buy when it's below the 20 line, hooking and moving up. You would short or sell when it's above the 80 line, hooking and going down. Now I just drew these lines on a few of these here, but you can see pretty darn uncanny in terms of how accurate it is. There's a buy signal right there. That would have been a nice entry. There's a sell signal right there. There's a buy signal right there. There's a sell signal right there. There's a buy. There's a sell. There's a buy. There's a sell. There's a buy. And there's a sell. Pretty darn accurate, guys. So stochastics are something that I always like to track as well throughout the day. Over, overbought, oversold indicator. Uh, the Bollinger Bands, uh, the, these were put together by John Bollinger. And um, 
they're pretty interesting. Uh, Bollinger bands uh, basically are what are called envelopes. So there are other types of indicators out there called envelopes. They call it an envelope because you can kind of see how it just it, it, it envelops uh, the price of the stock. But there's a, it, a couple of components inside of it, and it's just it's the middle line right here is the 20 period single moving average, and the upper band and the lower band, and the upper band and the lower band are defining a two standard deviation move in the stock. And the idea is just that stocks, whether they are in a massive uptrend or even a massive downtrend, tend to work a little bit like a rubber band. Um, they don't just go out and break the rubber band, usually. What will usually happen is that as sides get stretched and pushed, they will come back in line. And that's sort of the idea with stocks as well, that when a stock has a, a big move and a two standard deviation move is a big move. When a stock has a big move, generally speaking, it's going to retrace a little bit before it continues on whatever path it's going to continue on. So the idea here is, again, when it hits uh, the bottom band, you would want to be buying. When it hits the top band, you would want to be selling. Again, when it hits the bottom band, you want to be buying. When it hits the top band, you want to be selling. Okay. So uh, Bollinger Bands uh, are something that you can throw on top of any other indicators that you may be using on your chart. And I use them as confirmation indicators. I don't trade buy-sell signals solely off of Bollinger Bands. I use them as a confirmation tool. So generally speaking, and this is my rule of thumb, this is what a lot of traders, this is what I learned coming up through the ranks, you want to have at least three indicators all lined up all confirming whatever it is you believe so if you're looking for a bearish trade you need three indicators implying a downward move is imminent vice versa if you're looking for a bullish trade you want at least three indicators that's why we use these disparate indicators they all do things a little differently and if you can get three of them all to work in conjunction it really increases our probabilities of success Pivot points uh, are also one of my favorites. So a pivot point is a technical indicator, and it is determining the overall trend of the market over different time frames. So the um, the math behind the pivot point, pretty easy. Uh, we take the average of the intraday high and low and the closing price from the previous day. So it's just an average of the high-low divided by the closing price. Okay, And uh, it helps us define or find support resistance areas. So if we look at an example here, uh, you can see right here, um, these are all support levels based on that math, and these would be resistance levels, okay? And if you, uh, if you, if you do some day trading and you look at these support resistance levels on almost any underlying, you'll find they're pretty darn accurate in terms of defining those support resistance areas. So I use pivot points quite a bit. Uh, the VWAP, uh, that's the volume weighted average price. Now I use the VWAP, it, it seems like lately uh, I'm hearing more and more and more about the VWAP and, and, and how important it is in this amazing new technical indicator that we can use to track. Uh, guys, the VWAP has been around forever. It was, I don't want to say it was necessarily my primary tool, but it was one of my very critical tools that I used as a venture capitalist. When I was in venture capital, we were taking uh, micro cap companies public and you had insiders. You had highly compensated individuals or insiders in the corporation that wanted to either buy into the company with more shares or wanted to, in a lot of cases, liquidate their uh, position in the company, right? Cash out. So we were talking about orders of 10,000 to maybe a $200,000 share order in these micro cap companies, you can't just go out and, and, and buy 200,000 shares or sell 200,000 shares of a stock that is a $30 million company, $100 million company. It's going to move the price, right? So VWAP or volume weighted average price gives us the average price that a security was traded at based on the price, obviously, but also the volume. 
Now this is critical. So the VWAP, guys, that's what I'm looking at as a venture capitalist or as a broker trying to move very large positions. That's the price that you had to beat. Okay, That's the price that you needed to beat. And the challenge, of course, is that you look at a stock, maybe it trades uh, uh, 300 shares at $10 a share, and uh, then it jumps up to uh, $10.75, but it trades 50 shares, right? Uh, or more, probably as a better example than that, let's say that it, it trades uh, 3,000 shares at $10 a share, and then it jumps up to 10.75 and it trades 100 shares, okay? That's not really, because this is volume weighted, that's not really a price that we're looking at as being real in terms of being able to get in and get out at those right prices. So VWAP can act as a support resistance area. So this is again one of the key things that we're just always trying to find, which is support and resistance, right? VWAP is a good tool at helping us do that. So you can see right here uh, in this example that uh, this little teal line right there, that's the VWAP. You can see that the price was all over the place, but the average price was right in here. So the goal, if I was accumulating positions here on this trade uh, for this particular day, would have been to pay below the VWAP number. If I'm shorting it, I want to have shorted it above the VWAP number. Okay, That sort of gives me a better idea of where the action, where the price action is in that stock on that particular day. And then uh, I think this is last, but not necessarily least, uh, a four-time uh, chart overlay. So this is something that I picked up with uh, the great Scott Phillips, a wonderful Forex trader. And I've taken this and, and transferred it over from my Forex trading to equities. And it is just simply doing a four-time overlay chart, which you can do quite easily uh, inside of Tastyworks. Uh, Tastyworks not known for their amazing charting capabilities, but they do have this ability and it's quite nice and it's very, very easy to set up. But I look at a one minute chart, a five minute chart, a, a half hour chart, and an hour chart, or something along those lines. One day chart, one hour chart, 30 minutes, something along those lines, but you're breaking up your increments over a different staggered time throughout the day. And the idea is that when you can get all four of these charts, when you can get maybe your one minute chart, uh, your 15, 20 minute chart, your one hour chart, your day chart, when you can get all of these lined up in unison and moving in the same direction, gives you a lot of confidence that probably if you go back to any of your volume indicators, you're going to see that most of that volume is buying volume, not selling volume. Again, it gives you confidence uh, in what you're trading. Also, your shorter term charts, your one minute charts, five minute charts, 10 minute charts, these are going to be your canary in the coal mines. So yeah, maybe on the day we're up nicely, maybe hour by hour we're up nicely, but you start looking at your shorter term, you go, hmm, looks like we're kind of starting to roll over here. I might want to be aware that there might be a substantive directional change take place. So guys, these are the indicators that I use. I think there's 13 of them there. And that's why I do have so many different charts, uh, different uh, displays that I use to trade off of, simply because uh, I like to be able to look at them individually. This is a little bit easier for me, but uh, again, that gives you an idea of what I do. So uh, if you want to touch base with me, guys, I love hearing from you. The easiest way is just to shoot me a DM on Twitter. You can uh, DM me anytime. I, I talk to probably 20 or 30 of you guys a day throughout the trading day on Twitter. Uh, my handle is just at Theta Seller. Uh, and if you ever are interested in wanting to look at our live trading room, we do live trade the S&P 500 every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, or any day that there is a zero data expiration coming up. And uh, here's a link for you right here that you can uh, look at a one day free demo, if you will. Love to have you come out, hang out for a day, trade alongside of us and see what you think. So hopefully those were helpful for you guys. That gives you an idea of the indicators that I use uh, as I'm out trading.